Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a good day to all of you. Today, we are going to start a new chapter that is Understanding Organic Reactions. In order to understand organic reactions, we must first know how to write the equations for these organic reactions. So, first, equations for organic reactions are usually drawn with a single reaction arrow between the starting material and the product. So the reagent, which is the chemical substance with which an organic compound reacts, is sometimes drawn on the left side of the equation with the other reactants. At other times, the reagent is drawn on the arrow itself. Although the solvent is often omitted from the equation, most organic reactions take place in a solvent. At times, the solvent is also the reagent. The solvent and temperature of the reaction may, may be added above or below the arrow. The symbols H nu and delta are used for the reactions that require light and heat respectively. Let us look now at different ways of writing organic reactions. In the first reaction, we can see cyclohexane reacting with bromine. Now, bromine is the reagent. It can be written on the left side of the arrow or it can be written on the arrow as we see in the given diagram. And the product, which is 1,2-dibromocyclohexane, is written on the right. In another reaction, where we see cyclohexane reacting with bromine, we have uh, H nu, which is indicating light is needed, or delta, where it is indicated that heat is needed and also CCL4 which is the solvent we can write it all on the arrow and in this case it is the substitution reaction where we have the one of the hydrogen being substituted by the bromine and the product is bromocyclohexane in another example when we have two sequential reactions are carried out without drawing any intermediate compound, the steps are usually numbered above or below the reaction arrow. The con this convention signifies that the first step occurs before the second step and the reagents are added in sequence, not at the same time. We look at the uh, uh, example given, we have acetone which is first reacted with methyl magnesium bromide and in the second step we put in water which is hydrolysis giving the organic product which is the tertiary butyl alcohol and the inorganic byproduct which is often omitted which is the magnesium hydroxy bromide another type of reaction is the substitution reaction the okay, substitution is a reaction in which an atom or a group of atoms is replaced by another atom or group of atoms. In general, we, we have Y replacing Z on a carbon atom, as seen in the example given below. Substitution reactions involve sigma bonds. That is, one sigma bond breaks and another forms at the same carbon atom. The most common examples of substitution occur when Z is a hydrogen or a heteroatom that is more electronegative than carbon. For instance, let's look at these examples. We have methyl iodide. The iodide is the nucleophile that's going to be replaced by the chloride. And we can see when the chloride replaces the iodide, we will get the methyl chloride. And in the other example, we can see SL chloride where the chlorine in the SL chloride is replaced by the hydroxide and we get the ethanoic acid as the product. Okay. Elimination is a reaction in which elements of the starting materials are lost and a pi bond is formed. As we can see in this general formula, we have X and Y both the sigma bonds between carbon and X and carbon and Y are broken. And then a pi bond is formed and XY 
is the byproduct of the reaction. In an elimination reaction, we can see two groups, X and Y, are removed from the starting material. So, two sigma bonds are broken. And in the product, we see a pi bond is formed between adjacent atoms. The most common examples of elimination occur when the X is a hydrogen and Y is a heteroatom and from a more electronegative uh, atom that then carbon. Okay. In the examples given here, we see in the first example, we lose a hydrogen and a bromine. A hydrogen bromide is lost and uh, the compound is reacted with a base and we have the product which is an ethene where we see a pi bond has been formed. Is formed and uh, we have water and the bromide ion given off. And in another example, in the cyclohexanol, we have a loss of water molecule. We can do this by using an acid catalyst. And we can see in the product, we have cyclohexene, which now has a pi bond with water as the byproduct. Another reaction that we are going to look at is addition. An addition reaction is a reaction in which elements are added to the starting material. The starting material we can see has unsaturation. So when we add in the reagent like XY, both the, we can see the pi bond is broken and two new sigma bonds are formed. Let us look at the examples of addition reaction. In the first reaction, we can see ethene, the pi bond will be broken in ethene with the addition of hydrogen bromide. And when hydrogen bromide is added, we can see two new sigma bonds are formed. And in the second reaction, which is cyclohexene, that is reacting with water, with the sulfuric acid as its catalyst, the pi bond will be broken and a molecule hydrogen, uh, a molecule of water consisting of hydrogen and hydroxide is added and we will have the product which is cyclohexanol. Addition and elimination reactions are exactly opposite. A pi bond is formed in elimination reactions whereas a pi bond is broken in addition reactions. We can see in the diagram given, we have a substance which, is, which has X and Y. When a pi bond is formed, it will form an unsaturated molecule. So this pi bond can be broken in an addition reaction where we add in the X and Y and we will see two sigma bonds being formed. In order to see how a reaction occurs, we have to write a reaction mechanism. A reaction mechanism is a detailed description of how bonds are broken and formed as starting material is converted into the product. And a reaction can occur either in one step or in a series of steps. So, a one-step reaction is called a concerted reaction. No matter how many bonds are broken or formed, a starting material is converted directly to a product. A stepwise reaction involves more than one step. A starting material is first converted to an unstable intermediate called a reactive intermediate which then goes on to form the product. As we can see in the diagram given, A becomes the reactive intermediate first before it becomes the product B. Regardless of how many steps there are in a reaction, there are only two ways to break or cleave a bond. The electrons in the bond can be divided equally or unequally between the two atoms of the bond. So breaking a bond by equally dividing the electrons between two atoms in the bond is called homolysis or a homolytic cleavage. As we can see, here in the example given, A and B is bonded together and when it is cleavage, when homolysis or homolytic cleavage occurs, we will get two atoms where 
each atom gets an electron each and they are known as free radicals. Okay. Breaking a bond by unequally dividing the electrons between the two atoms in the bond is called heterolysis or heterolytic cleavage. Heterolysis of a bond between A and B can give either A or B the two electrons in the bond. When A and B have different electronegativities, the electrons end up with the more electronegative atom. For instance, we can see in a heterolytic cleavage, the electrons will be divided unequally. If B is more electronegative than A, then B will be the anion and A will be the cation. But if A is more electronegative than B, A will be the anion and B will be the cation. So, you can see as a summary, you see, homolysis and heterolysis both require energy. Homolysis generates uncharged reactive intermediates with unpaired electrons, whereas heterolysis generates charged intermediates. In order to write a reaction mechanism, we must show how the bond is bro broken and how the bond is made. So, in order to illustrate the movement of the electrons, when it, in, it consists of just one electron, we use a half-headed curved arrow, which is sometimes called a fish hook, and a full-headed arrow full-headed curved arrow will show the movement of an electron pair. As we can see in the example given, in homolysis, we use fish hook arrows where we show electron moving to both the atoms where A gets an electron and B gets another electron. So two half-headed curved arrows are needed for two single electrons. In the heterolysis example, we can see where both the electrons are moving to B, which is the more electronegative atom. So, one full-headed arrow is uh, needed for the one electron pair. Homolysis will always generate two uncharged species with unpaired electrons and a reactive intermediate with a single unpaired electron is called a radical. Radicals are highly unstable because they contain an atom that does not have an octet of electrons. In heterolysis, we see there is the generation of a carbocation or a carbon ion. Both carbocations and carbon ions are un unstable intermediates. A carbocation contains a carbon surrounded by only six electrons, whereas a carbon ion has a negative charge on a carbon, which is not a very electronegative atom. Okay, let us see how we can have three reactive intermediates resulting from homolysis and heterolysis of a CZ bond. So in homolysis, using half-headed arrows, we show the movement of one electron going to the carbon and one electron going to the Z. So we have two radicals, which is the carbon radical and also the Z radicals. And these radicals are intermediates in radical reactions. In heterolysis, we use full-headed arrows. So if, Z, if the electrons are traveling to Z, so the arrow will point towards Z. But if the electrons are traveling to carbon, it will point towards carbon. In the first example, when the electrons are going to Z, we will get a carbocation and the Z anion. And in the second example, where the carbon has the electrons, we will get a carbanion plus the Z cation. So these are actually the ionic intermediates that are seen in polar reactions. Radicals and carbocations are electrophiles because they contain an electron-deficient carbon. Carbon ions are 
nucleophiles because they contain a carbon with a lone pair. So you see a radical will have an unpaired electron. A carbocation would have only six electrons, whereas a carbon ion will have all eight electrons. It is octet, but it also has a lone pair. So radicals and carbocations are electrophiles because they contain an electron deficient carbon. Carbon ions are nucleophiles because they contain a carbon with a lone pair. Now we are going to look at bond formation. Bond formation occurs in two different ways. Two radicals can each donate one electron to form a two electron bond. As we can see in the first example, we have A and B donating an electron H and it forms a sigma bond between A and B. Alternatively, two ions with unlike charges can come together with the negatively charged ion donating both electrons to form the resulting two electron bond. So bond formation in always will release energy. A number of types of arrows are used in describing organic reactions. Let us look at table 6.1 which shows a summary of arrow types that are used in chemical reactions. Okay, when we have just one arrow pointing from left to right, which this is actually called the reaction arrow and is drawn between the starting materials and products in an equation. And we have double reaction arrows which shows equilibrium. These are also known as equilibrium arrows. This is drawn between the starting materials and products in an equilibrium reaction equation. Double headed arrows. Double headed arrows are drawn between resonance structures. And we have a full headed curved arrows. This shows movement of an electron pair and we have half headed arrow which shows movement of a single electron. Energy is always needed to cleave a bond. So the bond dissociation energy is the energy needed to homolytically cleave a covalent bond. As we see in the example given, a homolysis requires energy. So when the bond between A and B breaks, we get two uh, radicals, which is radical A and radical B. And we need an amount of energy, which is called the bond dissociation energy between of A and B. So the energy absorbed or released in any reaction is symbolized by the symbol delta H naught. And this is called the enthalpy change or heat of reaction. When delta H naught is positive, energy is absorbed and the reaction is endothermic. When delta H naught is negative, energy is released and the reaction is exothermic. Bond dissociation energy is the delta H for a specific kind of reaction. And for instance, the homolysis of a covalent bond to form two radicals. Bond breaking always requires energy. So, bond dissociation energies are always positive and homolysis is always endothermic. Conversely, bond formation always releases energy and thus is always exothermic. Let's look for example at the hydrogen bond which requires 104 kilocalories per mole to cleave and it will release 104 kilocalories when the bond is formed. So for the hydrogen to cleave to form hydrogen radicals, we need 104 kilocalories of energy. But when both two uh, hydrogen radicals come together to form the hydrogen molecule, 104 kilocalories per mole is released. Table 6.2 shows the values for bond dissociation energies of some common bonds. Comparing bond dissociation energies is equivalent to comparing the bond strength. The stronger the bond, 
the higher is bond dissociation energy. Bond dissociation energies decrease down a column of the periodic table. Generally, shorter bonds are stronger bonds. Okay, looking at the example given, we have methyl fluoride, which has a bond dissociation energy of 109 kilocalories per mole, and methyl chloride, which is uh, which has 84 kilocalories per mole, methyl bromide 70, and methyl iodide only 56. So as we go down the column, the size of the halogen increases. So the bond strength will also decrease. So the bond dissociation and energy will also decrease. So as we can see, when the bond is shorter, as in methyl fluoride, the bond strength would be stronger and the energy for to dissociate the bond would be higher. Bond dissociation energies are used to calculate the enthalpy change, that is delta H naught, in a reaction in which several bonds are broken and formed. Delta H naught is positive, that means more energy is needed to break bonds then is released in forming bonds. The bonds broken in the starting material are stronger than the bonds formed in the product. When delta H0 is negative, which means more energy is released in forming bonds, then is needed to break bonds. So the bonds formed in the product are stronger than the bonds broken in the starting material. So we can have a equation where we have the delta H naught of the overall enthalpy change is equal to the sum of the delta delta H naught of broken of the bonds broken plus or minus the sum of the delta H naught of the bonds formed. Okay, let us now look at an example of bonds broken and bonds formed and how to calculate out the delta H naught for the reaction. First of all, we have tertiary butyl chloride. So the bond in tertiary butyl chloride between carbon and chlorine has a value of 79 kilocalories per mole. And we will also break a bond between hydrogen and oxygen in water. And this bond has a value of 119 kilocalories per mole. So the total amount needed to break the bonds would be 79 plus 119, we have 198 kilocalories per mole. So this is the energy needed to break the bonds. And when we look at the products, we have a bond, a new bond between carbon and hydroxide and a bond between hydrogen and chlorine. So the bond between carbon and hydroxide, when it is formed, it should be minus 90, 96 kilocalories per mole and the bond that is formed between hydrogen and chlorine which is minus 103 kilocalories per mole and the total uh, energy released in forming the bonds is minus 199 kilocalories per mole. So the overall delta H naught would be the sum in the first step minus the sum or plus the sum in the second step and we will have the overall change would be negative 1 kilocalorie per mole. So when we have a delta H value which is negative, the reaction is exothermic and energy is released. The bonds broken in the starting material are weaker than the bonds that are formed in the product. Okay, let us look at another example of how to calculate out the dissociation energies in the combustion of uh, isooctane and also glucose. When isooctane is burnt in oxygen, it will give off carbon dioxide and water. And the total energy that is released in this reaction is negative 1303 kilocalories per mole. And uh, when we have new glucose, we need when glucose is burnt in oxygen, it will give off 6 moles of carbon dioxide plus 6 moles of water. And the energy released in this reaction is minus 
687 kilocalories per mole. Now the delta H for both reactions for is negative. So both reactions are exothermic. Both isooctane and glucose release energy on oxidation because the bonds in the products are stronger than the bonds in the reactants. Bond dissociation energies present overall energy changes only. They reveal nothing about the reaction mechanism or how fast a reaction proceeds. Bond dissociation energies are determined for reactions in the gas phase. Whereas most organic reactions occur in a liquid solvent where solvation energy contributes to the overall enthalpy of a reaction. Bond dissociation energies are imperfect indicators of energy changes in a reaction. However, using bond dissociation energies to calculate out that delta H0 gives a useful approximation of the energy changes that occur when bonds are broken and formed in a reaction. For a reaction to be practical, the equilibrium must favor products and the reaction rate must be fast enough to form them in a reasonable time. These two conditions depend on thermodynamics and kinetics respectively. Thermodynamics describes how the energies of reactants and products compare and what the relative amounts of reactants and products are at equilibrium. Kinetics de describes reaction rates. So the equilibrium constant, which is K, EQ, is a mathematical expression that relates the amount of starting material and product at equilibrium. For instance, we have a reaction where A and B are the starting material and giving C and D as the products, the equilibrium constant is equals to the concentration of the products, which is the concentration of C times the concentration of D divided by the concentration of the starting materials divided by the concentration of A times the concentration of B. The size of the equilibrium constant expresses whether the starting materials or products predominate once equilibrium is reached. When the equilibrium constant is more than one, equilibrium favors the products, which is C and D, and the equilibrium lies to the right as the equation is written. When the equilibrium constant is less than one, equilibrium favors the starting materials A and B, and the equilibrium lies to the left as the equation is written. For a reaction to be useful, the equilibrium constant must favor the products and therefore the equilibrium constant must be uh, more than 1. The position of the equilibrium is determined by the relative energies of the reactants and products. Delta G0 is the overall energy difference between reactants and products. Delta G0 is the free energy change and this is equal equals to the free energy of the products minus the free energy of the reactants. Figure 6.3 shows the summary of the relationship between delta G0 and the equilibrium constant. We know that equilibrium con uh, will always favor the species lower in energy. So on the left we see the reactants is lower energy than the products. So delta G0 will be more than zero. The equilibrium constant now will be less than one because equilibrium favors the starting material. In the second, on the right side, we can see that the products is lower in energy than the reactants. So delta G0 is less than zero and equilibrium constant is more than 1 and we will have since the products are more stable so the equilibrium favors the products delta g0 is related to the equilibrium constant by the following equation we have delta g0 equals to minus 2.303 rt log of the equilibrium constant r is the r has the value of 1.9 Eight seven calories 
uh, kilocalories, which is this is the gas constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. So we can see now that the equilibrium constant depends on the energy difference between the reactants and the products. So when the equilibrium constant is more than 1, log of the equilibrium constant is positive, making delta G not negative, and energy is released. Thus, equilibrium favors the products when the energy of the products is lower than the energy of the reactants. But when the equilibrium constant is less than 1, so the log of the equilibrium constant is negative, making delta G not positive, and energy is absorbed. So, the equilibrium favors the reactants when the energy of the products is higher than the energy of the reactants. Compounds that are lower in energy have increased stability. The equilibrium favors the products when they are more stable, which is when they are lower in energy than the starting materials of a reaction. Because delta G0 depends on the logarithm of the equilibrium constant, a small change in energy corresponds to a large difference in the relative amount of starting material and product at equilibrium. Looking at table 6.3, we see some representative values for delta G0 and K equilibrium and the equilibrium constant at 25 degrees Celsius for reactions from A to B. Okay, we, now we can see a small difference in, in free energy means a large difference in the amount of A and B at equilibrium. For instance, we, when we have the delta G0 is plus 4.2 kilocalories per mole, it is essentially all A. And when it is minus 4.2 kilocalories per mole, it is essentially all products, which is B. Okay, an example of what we just saw can be seen in mono-substituted cyclohexanes, which exist as two different chair conformations that rapidly interconvert at room temperature with the conformation having the substituent in the roomier equatorial position favored. Let us look at phenyl cyclohexane. In phenyl cyclohexane, the A conformation, we can see the substituent is at the axial position. And when it flips, we see that the substituent now, which is the phenyl, at the equatorial position. The difference in energy is minus 2.9 kilocalories per mole. And we can see with this, that we can calculate out the equilibrium constant to be roughly 100. And so, we can see now, 100 times more B than we will have than more than A at equilibrium, since equatorial position is the more stable conformation. So, knowing the energy difference between two conformations, we can calculate the amount of each at equilibrium. Delta G0 depends on delta H0 uh, and also the entropy change which is delta S0. Entropy change is a measure of the change in the randomness of a system. The more disorder present, the higher the entropy. Gas molecules move more freely than liquid molecules and are higher in entropy. Cyclic molecules have more restricted bond rotation than similar acyclic molecules and are lower in entropy. Entropy is positive when the products are less ordered than the reactants. And entropy is negative when the products are more ordered than the reactants. And reactions resulting in increased, that increased entropy are favored. Delta G0 is related to delta H and delta S0 by the following equation. We see delta G0, which is the total energy change, is equivalent to delta H0, which is the change in bonding energy, minus temperature times delta S0. Delta S is the change in the disorder, and T is the temperature in Kelvin.
Okay, the equation indicates that the total energy change is due to two factors. That is the change in bonding energy and also the change in disorder. The change in bonding energy can be calculated from bond dissociation energies. Entropy changes are important when 1. The number of molecules of starting material differs from the number of molecules of product in the balanced chemical equation. And 2. When an acyclic molecule is cyclized to a cyclic one or a cyclic molecule is converted to an acyclic one. Okay. In the example given, we can see the molecule AB when the bond breaks will form two, pro two radical products, the radical A and radical B. So entropy increases and favors the products. We can see there are two moles of products as compared to one mole of the reactant. So, but in the other example where we have a long chain between X and Y and when X and Y reacts, you will form a cyclized molecule. So that is restricted movement. And from here, because of the this restriction in movement, we find that the entropy decreases and it will also it will favor the reactants. So in most most other reactions that are not carried out at high temperature, the entropy term T times delta S naught is small compared to the enthalpy term delta H naught. And therefore it is usually neglected. So delta G would be roughly equivalent to delta H naught, which is the total energy change is approximated by the change in the bonding energy only. So in order to describe how a reaction proceeds, we need to use energy diagrams. An energy diagram is a schematic representation of the energy changes that takes place as reactants are converted to products. An energy diagram plot plots the energy on the y-axis versus the progress of the reaction, often labelled as the reaction coordinate, on the x-axis. The energy difference between reactants and products is delta H0. So if the products are lower in energy than the reactants, the reaction is exothermic and energy is released. If the products are higher in energy than the reactants, the reaction is endothermic and energy is consumed. The unstable energy maximum as a chemical reaction proce proceeds from reactants to products is called the transition state. The transition state species can never be isolated. The energy difference between the transition state and the starting material is called the energy of activation, Ea. Let us see now how we are going to draw the energy diagram for a general reaction is for a molecule between uh, a molecule of AB that is going to react with the anion C where we have the bond between AB being broken and a, in the product a new bond between B and C is formed. So when we draw the energy diagram first of all we draw a curve on the left side of the curve is the starting material and then we put in the activation energy which is Ea the amount is absorbed and until a certain state where we call this the transition state which is at the peak of the curve and then we have bond being, being uh, formed between B and C and when this bond is formed and if the energy uh, of between B and C is lower than than the starting material we will have the energy the products uh, are lower in energy than the starting material so there is a difference in the enthalpy which is delta H naught will be energy given off the energy of activation is the minimum amount of energy needed to break the bonds in the reactants so the larger the Ea the greater the amount of energy that is needed to break the bonds and the slower the reaction rate. The structure of the transition state is somewhere between the structures of the starting material and product. 
Any bond that is partially formed or broken is drawn with a dashed line. Any atom that gains or loses a charge contains a partial charge in the transition state. So transition states are drawn in brackets with a superscript double dagger. As we can see in the example given, that the bond between A and B is partially broken and the bond between B and C is partially formed. Both A and C has partial negative charges and the overall transition state is drawn with the brackets with the double dagger symbol. Figure 6.4 shows some representative energy diagrams. In the first example, we can see there is a large Ea. So this will be a very slow reaction. And the energy of the reactants is lower than the energy of the products. So delta H is positive. So this is an endothermic reaction. Example 2 shows a large Ea, which is a slow reaction also but the energy of the product is lower than the energy of the starting material so this reaction is an exothermic reaction example 3 shows a low ea which shows a fast reaction so since the products has higher energy than the starting material this will be an endothermic reaction okay in example 4 is also another example of low activation energy so it is a fast reaction but as we can see now the products is lower in, in energy than the starting material so delta H is negative and this is an exothermic reaction okay figure 6.5 shows the diagram of two energy diagrams of A and B now in these two diagrams we are going to compare the delta H and Ea and uh, as we can see, for diagram A, the Ea is much lower than the one in B. So the reaction will be faster than the reaction in B. And in both these energy diagrams, we can see the delta H is the same. It is, they are both exothermic reactions with the same value of E of delta H. Consider now a two-step reaction mechanism. So we're going to see how we're going to draw the energy diagram for this two-step reaction mechanism. In the first step, we have hydrolysis of the AB bond, where we have the bond between A and B breaking, where A receives the electrons and B is the intermediate, which is the cation. And in step two, B forms a bond with the anion C. So we can see the formation of a new bond between a and B. So now we're going to draw an energy diagram for each step. The two energy diagrams must be combined to form an energy diagram for the overall two-step reaction. Each step has its own energy barrier with a transition state at the energy maximum. The following diagram shows the energy diagram of step 1. In step 1, we need to break the bond between A and B. So, energy is absorbed. The activation energy absorbed and we will reach to the peak of the, of the curve where we have the transition state. And the transition state, we will see a, the bond between A and B being slightly broken and a partial positive charge on B and a partial negative charge on A and some energy is released and that will be the formation of the intermediates. Since the intermediates are of higher energy than the reactants, so delta H for step 1 is positive because energy is needed to break the AB bond. Okay, this following diagram shows the energy di diagram for step number 2. In step number 2, we have the intermediate B that will react with the anion C. When B and C react, they form a bond. So there is an activation energy that is needed to form this bond. So at the transition step of step 2, we will have the bond between C, B and C being formed and partial charges of negative charge on C and a positive 
or she'll charge on B. And then when the product that is formed, that is the full bond between B and C, we can see that delta H2 now is negative because energy is released when the, the bond between B and C is formed. Okay, let us look now at figure 6.6. .6. It shows the complete energy diagram for the two-step conversion of the compound AB plus the C and ion to the products, the A and, A and ion with the new bond between B and C formed. Okay, let us look now. The transition states are located at the energy maxima, which is at the top of the peaks. While well, the reactive intermediate B plus is located at the energy minima. Each step is characterized by its own value of delta H and the activation energy Ea. The overall difference between the starting material and products is labeled as delta H not overall. In this example, the products of the two-step sequence are at lower energy than the starting materials. So, the delta H not overall for this reaction is exothermic. Since step 1 has the higher energy transition state, it is the rate determining step for this reaction. Kinetics is the study of reaction rates. So, let us recall, Ea is the energy barrier that must be exceeded for reactants to be converted to products. And if we have a difference in Ea, the lower Ea would be the faster reaction. And the larger Ea will give the slower reaction. Okay. The higher the concentration of the reactants, the faster would be the rate. So the higher the temperature, the faster is the rate. Delta G0, Delta H0 and K equilibrium do not determine the rate of a reaction. These quantities indicate the direction of the equilibrium and the relative energy of reactants and products. A rate law or rate equation shows the relationship between the reaction rate and the concentration of the reactants. It is experimentally determined. So the rate law or the rate equation is equals to the equals to K times the concentration of the reactants, where K is the rate constant. Fast reactions have large rate constants. Slow reactions have small rate constants. The rate constant K and the energy of activation Ea are inversely related. A high Ea corresponds to a small K. A rate equation contains concentration terms for all reactants in a one-step mechanism. A rate equation contains concentration terms for only the reactants involved in the rate determining step in a multi-step reaction. The order of a rate reaction equals the sum of the exponents of the concentration terms in the rate equation. In the example of the reaction between AB and the anion C, this is a one-step reaction. So both reactants are involved in the only step. So both reactants determine the rate of reaction. So the rate of the rate equation would be equals to K times the concentration of AB and the concentration of C. So the sum of the exponents is equals to 2 and this is a second order rate equation. A two-step reaction has a slow rate determining step and a fast step. In a multi-step mechanism, the reaction can occur no faster than its rate determining step. Only the concentration of the reactants in the rate determining step appears in the rate equation. For instance, we have AB when the bond between A and B breaks, will, it will form the anion A and the cation B. And in the second step, B and C forms a bond. So, the breaking of the bond between A and B is the rate determining step. So, only the concentration of AB determines the rate. You can see now when we write the rate equation, 
rate is equals to K times the concentration of AB. And this is a first order rate equation. Let us see now the effects of catalyst. Some reactions do not proceed at a reasonable rate unless a catalyst is added. A catalyst is a substance that speeds up the rate of a reaction. It is recovered unchanged in a reaction and it does not appear in the product. Let us look at figure 6.7. We see the effect of a catalyst on the reaction. When we put in a catalyst, we can see the reaction with the lower EA is the one that is catalyzed. But the first reaction where the EA is higher or larger, the reaction is uncatalyzed. So the larger EA would give a slower reaction with that is the uncatalyzed reaction. And the lower EA will give a faster reaction. This is the catalyzed reaction. So the catalyst actually lowers the energy of activation, thus increasing the rate of the catalyzed reaction. The energy of the reactants and products is the same in both the uncatalyzed and catalyzed reactions. So the position of equilibrium is unaffected. Enzymes are actually biochemical catalysts composed of amino acids held together in a very specific three-dimensional shape. So enzymes are examples of catalysts. An enzyme contains a region called its active site which binds an organic reactant called a substrate. The resulting unit is called the enzyme substrate complex. Once bound, the organic substrate undergoes a very specific reaction at an enhanced rate. The products are then released. And we see in figure 6.8, it shows a schematic representation of an enzyme at work. We have the substrate, which are the blue and the green molecules. And we have the enzyme, which is the on orange molecules. So the starting material will be converted to the products when we see that the enzyme forms a substrate complex. The enzyme is the catalyst and this is recovered unchanged from the reaction at the end of the reaction. This completes the topic on understanding of organic reactions. Please try out all the exercises found at the back of the chapter for this and, and uh, when you try out all the exercises, you will have a better understanding of the topic. Thank you.